good afternoon everybody, um, good to see you all here. If some of you can just uh, put down in the uh, chat w um, box to say that you can actually hear me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that'll do, I think. Um, might get started now, maybe a minute earlier. That's okay. We've got plenty of people here who can um, hear me now, so hopefully we can begin this webinar. So welcome to the Voltman webinar, Application Watchdog. This webinar is to give you the basics for choosing and designing for an open area high bay lighting application with an emphasis on energy efficiency. The presenters today will be Yatsi Klipiets of Gerard Professional Solutions, Steve Hare of iLighting and Ben Brady of Osram. Please feel free to ask any questions at any time using the chat box in your browser. Um, some of you already know how to use it, which is wonderful. I'll get going then. So choosing a high bay luminaire for warehouse lighting. Uh, this is uh, me, Yasek Lipis from Gerard Professional Solutions. I'm the uh, Assistant Business Manager for Outdoor Lighting Controls, but I've also got some uh, history with regards to LED lighting solutions uh, from my previous work at Sylvania Lighting. Traditionally we see high bays for warehouse spaces uh, available in a few different styles. We've noticed that uh, people have used metal halide and high pressure sodium lamps and the picture on the right shows you a typical application. Um, Today there are many, many light sources available and all di offer different benefits and limitations. So we'll go through some of those points here. How do we determine the, bay, the high bay technology that will give us the best energy efficiency? So I'll go through a couple of slides talking about the different light sources. So let's look at the three most common types that you'll see in high bays used today. Uh, those being metal halide or sodium, T5 fluorescent and LED. With regards to metal halide, or some know, some know it as ceramic metal halide, it's quite a mature product. It has various suppliers who've been around in the industry for a very long time. There are many options in terms of power, lamp base, physical size, and lifetime. For metal, for metal halide, we commonly use 250 watt or 40, 400 watt uh, elliptical E40 base lamps, which give approximately 20,000 lumens and 40,000 lumens respectively for the bare lamp. Um, you can get them in 4000K 70 CRI, so that's the uh, colour rendering index, and they have a lifetime of about 15 to 20,000 hours before failure. For sodium, or high pressure sodium, um, various powers are available including 250 watt and 400 watt, amongst others, as well giving 30,000 lumens or 53,000 lumens respectively. So you can see it's quite a fair bit higher than your metal halides. However, the detriment to this is that the colour temperature is about 2050 Kelvin and it gives a very yellow or orange hue with a very low CRI of 20. Once again, the positive of this is that it's got a very long lifetime of about 55,000 hours. On this slide, I want to show you a few of these, a couple of examples of what metal halide lamps look like. Um, the spectral power density graphs are those colourful graphs you can see there, and they show the wavelengths of each lamp and a representation of what the high bay may look like that accommodates these lamps. This is probably the most common type of high bay that people have seen. Uh, it's important to see that in a sodium lamp on the right, its peak wavelength is in the yellow or orange, and this gives it poor colour rendering. That is generally um, pretty bad news for any type of manufacturing warehouse application where being able to reproduce a colour is important. The next light source I want to talk about is fluorescent tubes. This is also a mature light source. Uh, it's been around for quite a while. It's available in different shapes and sizes. And um, namely these are T5, T8, T12 and T9 being a circular type. T5 are the most commonly used types in the high bay applications due to their high efficiency. They're relatively small size. The diameter of the tubes is about 16mm and relatively long life. T5 are available in what they call high efficiency or HE and high output, HO. The options are listed there, so you can see 14 watts through to uh, 35 watts in your high efficiency versions and your high output versions are between 24 watts and 80 watts, where 80 watts gives about 6,100 lumens. 
the typical lifetime for T5 fluorescent tubes are about 24,000 hours. You can get them in a multitude of colour temperatures, so from 2700 Kelvin up to 6500 Kelvin, and you can get different types of CRI options or colour rendering index options from 70 through to 90 plus. Um, 90 plus obviously representing colour very well. This gives you a graphical representation of uh, the T5 light tube here. The dimensions are on the right hand side. Sorry, it's a bit, on my uh, presentation, it's a bit difficult to read, but these can be seen in many different uh, lamp catalogues, and you can see what the physical sizes are there. The two pictures are the high bays. Um, they're two typical high bays, each having about four or six T5 tubes to provide you with a desired light output. I think I've seen someone raise a hand. I think they may want to ask a question. If you want to ask a question, I can't actually hear you. So if you could um, maybe type a question uh, in the box at the bottom, I'll be able to hopefully answer the question that you have raised. Moving on. Um, I haven't seen that question come through, so maybe it was just a mistake. Uh, light sources. So LED is the next uh, light source that I quickly want to discuss. LED have almost limitless options for size, colour, CRI, power and efficiency. For me to go through this will be a couple of webinars in itself. But the important thing about um, high, uh, high bays that use LEDs is that there are very few large LEDs that can be used that range in the order of about 40 watts to 80 watts and COBs chip on board. Or you can use many high power LEDs such as 1 to 5 watt LEDs. Lifetimes are around the 50,000 hour mark to reach a level of 70% of its initial lumen output. So some people know this as an L70. LEDs don't tend to fail as the other uh, lamp sources do. They tend to just degrade in lumen output. Um, so the catastrophic failure is relatively unlikely. Now designs vary in shape and size, but most available LED high bays are made to be similar in light output to the traditional metal halide options. On this slide you can see a few different examples. Um, there are many, many examples available for LED high bay these days. The one on the left tries to mimic the look of traditional metal halide high bays, whereas the one on the right has done away with the traditional design somewhat and concentrates on the requirements of the luminaire, that being the form factor and a large enough heat sink to efficiently cool the LEDs. Finally, the graph shows the spectral power density of a typical 4000K ADCRI LED. Now, if you compared this to the metal halides, SPD in the previous slides, you could see how the colour rendering would, would be more even allowing a better representation of colour in manufacturing or warehousing applications. Now choosing the right option of your lamp source for your high bay. As with anything, compare your options, do your homework and uh, one of the things that I believe is most important is use a lighting designer to help you calculate the best fit for your space. If you were just to look at the specifications of the lamp sources on a data sheet, it may not give you a true indication. So what I'm trying to show you with this particular um, table is that the initial lamp lumens for metal halide and fluorescent tubes, T5s, have a very high initial lamp lumen. But when you go across to its exit lumens, which is the third column, you'll see that it reduces quite dramatically. And that's because of the light output ratio or the losses in the reflectors or the optics in the high bay. So when you look at the efficiency, which is your exit lumens versus your input power, the efficiency of a metal halide, 400 watts, about 50 lumens per watt. Your 6 by 54 watt T5 high bay is about 73 lumens per watt. And a typical 250 watt LED is about 80 lumens per watt. Now these figures are just figures which are generic. Um, by no means are, um, doesn't represent every single fitting. So that's why it's important to do your homework. So I'll now leave you to the uh, wonderful uh, dulcet tones of Steve here. He's going to talk about uh, his section. So if there's any, maybe if there's any questions, if you can put it down now in your uh, chat box, I'll answer them now. Otherwise, we'll move on to Steve.
Okay, hello everybody. Steve here from my lighting. Um, <clears throat> can I just do a test? Can everybody hear me? I'm actually not in the same office as uh, Yatsik and Ben. I'm actually in Brisbane. Um, so I just want to test my microphone and make sure everybody can hear. Thanks, Christian. Okay, in that case, I'll crack on. There's no questions come through. Um, <clears throat> so, what I'm going to run through is looking at, at the actual application of the three different uh, light source types and how they compare against each other. So the first application I'm going to look at is just a general general area high bay lighting. Uh, we're going to look at a lighting level 160 lux, something which should be used in an automatic food processing plant for example. The ceiling height will be 5 meters, the area will be 30 meters by 30 meters and the ambient temperature will be roughly 25 degrees and stable because we're working with food in this example. So the three light sources, as Yetzik was talking through, are fluorescent, ceramic metal halide, and LED. <coughs> um, <coughs> so the fluorescent luminaire is a 4 by 50 watt T5 fitting. The ceramic metal halide is a, is a single 150 watt lamp, and the LED is a 250 watt uh, LED luminaire. So you can see the total power of the fluorescent is 234 watts. The ceramic metal halide is 165, and the LED is 250. Um, because of the varying distributions and the varying powers of these, the quantity required to light the room to 160 lux changes. So you see there's only 16 of the LED required where there's 25 of the fluorescent and the ceramic metal halide. Um, and these result into uh, different total powers with the fluorescent using 5.85 kilowatts and the LED as low as 4 kilowatts and the ceramic metal halide just behind the LED. But uh, the total power is not the only thing to compare when looking at the different light sources. So I've created this table where we look across five different subjects and these are efficiency, the capital cost, maintenance cost, controllability and the glare. And I've used a star system to keep it simple. So five stars is very good and a single star is very bad and anything in between is in between. So if we look at the efficiency, we could see before the LED was just slightly more efficient than the ceramic metal halide across the across the uh, room, so that got five stars, where the CMH got four. The fluorescent was about 30% down, so that got two stars. Now if we look at capital cost, the ceramic metal halide high bay would generally be cheaper than the other two. You would, roughly speaking, you'll find the fluorescent would be twice the price uh, unit per unit compared to the ceramic metal halide, and the LED could be roughly three times that of the ceramic metal, hi metal halide. So that's why the CMH has got four stars. Now the LED has got more stars than the fluorescent because we actually use less of them. So um, <coughs> it actually worked out cheaper. Looking at maintenance cost. Now the LED um, is roughly around 50,000 hours. But the ceramic metal halide in this case, we looked at a twin arc lamp, which gave us um, double the life of a normal ceramic metal halide, metal halide lamp, which took us to 50,000 hours as well, as well, the same as the LED. Um, fluorescent has two star options, a two or a four, and this is because generally fluorescents run around 20,000 hours, but there are fluorescent lamps available which can take you up to 50, 60,000 hours. But I've considered just the two star option in this case because the, the long life lamps are very rarely used, I've found in this country. Now for controllability, uh, the CMH lamp <coughs> is uh, works the worst with control, with the LED being the best. Fluorescent is also very easily controlled, but the reason it, the LED gets one more star is because, for example, when you dim with LED, your efficiency increases, and does your life increase. So that got one more side than the fluorescent. And then glare is the last one. The fluorescent lamps are very long and have a large area, so the intensity of light coming out of them is is quite low, so they're very comfortable to look at. So the glare is very low, so we've got five stars there. The ceramic metal halides, you'll generally find they're a coated lamp, um, especially in the twin arc, you'll find their coated lamps as two. So again, they're fairly comfortable to look at, and you often find they're recessed inside a high bay, so you can't see the lamp all the time. LED, on the other hand, can vary from very good to very bad in terms of glare. Um, and that's why if you look at the totals, for the LED it's somewhere between 3 and 4 depending on that glare rating. So if we look across the board, it's actually very even for the three different light fittings. But LED or ceramic halide are going to give you the best solution um, from the fittings I looked at depending on the glare of the LED fitting. Okay, so that takes us to application number two. 
In this area, we looked at <clears throat> the same size room, but we're looking at a higher lighting level and a higher ceiling height. Uh, so this is a level that's commonly used in manufacturing. And we've looked at a high ambient temperature here, uh, circa 40 degrees Celsius. So we're looking at three different lamp types. For this time, the fluorescent would be four, four times 80 watt T5 luminaire. The ceramic metal halide is a single 360 watt ceramic metal halide. And the LED is the same 250 watt LED fitting. And again, if we look through the quantities, because of the high power of the ceramic metal halide, there's a lot less, quant a lot less um, luminaires required with the ceramic metal halide. And you see the power ratings are very different. So if we move on to the same table, comparing against the same five <coughs> uh, uh, areas, you can see the efficiency of the ceramic metal halide was, was very good. We've only got, so we've got five stars there. The LED was a few kilowatts below that, and then the fluorescent was um, considerably lower than the ceramic metal halide, so that only received one star. Uh, capital cost. Now, bear in mind the quantities are fewer of the ceramic metal halide, and it's the cheaper fitting. So that gained four stars, whereas you had the same number of fittings for the fluorescent and the LED, and considerably more than the ceramic metal halide. So they, they gained one and two stars, respectively. Um, maintenance cost was, was the same for fluorescent and the LED as before, but this ceramic metal halide lamp was only a single arc burner. So we're looking around 24,000 hours, opposed to 50,000 hours. So the, we've gone down to two star, stars on there. And again, controllability is the same, and glare is also the same. So if we look at uh, the, uh, the tables across there, you can see that because of the, the higher mounting height, the higher output you get from this ceramic metal halide, metal halide lamp, um, that in this application with the higher lighting level, higher mounting height, the ceramic metal halide has um, worked out the best in this application, but still is very close. So w what this really goes to show is that for every application, it, you need to do a good assessment of the, the fittings available, available to you, your, your exact application, to work out which light source is going to work best for you. So that's the end of my part of the presentation, and I'll hand you over to Ben Brady. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Steve. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. I've got a few messages here saying that the mic's a little bit distorted, so we've adjusted some levels here. Um, my name's Ben Brady. I work for Osram Australia as a field application engineer and product manager. Um, what, I'll, what I want to talk to you about today is the, the controls part of uh, industrial or high bay lighting. But before we get into that, I'll answer some of the questions that have been popping up. Um, that, uh, that we've got a, a few questions about uh, Yasik's presentation in, regard, in regards to the asterisks against his uh, uh, some of the values. Um, he mentioned uh, about absolute and relative photometry. So in regards to LED, we, we do a measurement or we get the output, which is uh, done through absolute photometry. So it's the absolute delivered lumen output. Um, so the numbers stated are the actual what you receive in the space. With uh, relative photometry, that's on traditional fitting. So you've got a, a light source that gives you 20,000 lumens, but then you've got the, the losses inside, a, inside the fitting, or uh, LOR. Um, so yeah, it's very much dependent on the performance of the fixture. Uh, so I hope that answers Peter G's question. And then the second question was, what factors affect glare in LED fittings? Um, uh, I'm assuming, uh, is that a question based upon why, why are LEDs potentially glary? Because they're a, uh, a point light source. Um, the ways we can uh, affect or improve the glare um, is through the secondary optics. Um, so we can cut down on that glare factor uh, that we see uh, into our eye, into the space. Um, and then obviously we could use uh, even further, you know, shrouds or, or, or uh, reflector skirts or something, uh, depending on the application. So I hope that, that answers both of those questions. Um, moving on into my presentation, which is uh, all things controls. <coughs> so 
Um, we understand that high bay lighting or industrial lighting um, has become a real key topic of, of efficiency, efficiency in terms of the energy used, but efficiency in terms of uh, the operation and the maintenance. Uh, we need to be more efficient in, in both use and the service of it. Um, uh, once we choose our efficient light source, be it, be it a traditional uh, you know, T5 solution or a you know, LED solution, um, we can't just sit back and you know, dust our hands off and say that's the job done because the reality is that uh, you know, the uh, energy bill will uh, keep on going up um, and we need to progressively um, you know, combat that or, or you know, ensure that we are doing the right things and being responsible in our, in our lighting uh, of our spaces. Um, what I wanted to uh, highlight everybody to, and I brought this up in, a, in the past smart lighting um, uh, webinar, uh, talking about you know just sort of strategies that we can uh, you know uh, action in our spaces. It can be one strategy or all six of these strategies. These are by no means a hard and fast rule, but I, I think a really good uh, place to start and consider and and, and take these on board. Um, just got another question come in. What about warehouse rack lighting versus open space examples? So, um, with warehouse rack lighting, we're going to need um, high enough lum uh, illuminance levels to both give us the light on the floor as well as some vertical illumination, so we can see, you know, the pick face. Um, uh, so that could be in terms of the, the particular optics. Um, we might go for a, a tighter beam angle with more fixtures to give us a better uh, vertical illumination as well as giving us the, the right light on the space. Clearly racking is going to stop uh, you know, light spilling out so again we're going to need to use uh, efficient or efficient use of the light sources um, to, to light up each uh, rack or, or row appropriately. Um, I just want to look at, uh, back into my presentation, the six uh, strategies that we can engage, applying them to the to the three core lighting groups that we've been talking about uh, this evening. Okay, so let's look at the ceramic metal halide or, or just HID in general. Now, these are all general concepts, okay? There are um, exceptions to all rules and uh, I can talk briefly about those uh, towards the end. but. The, the uh, general general rule is with with HID lighting, um, they are not a uh, they don't lend themselves to be a controllable light source. So if we look at our, our six strategies here on the screen, you know personal control it pretty much begins and ends with switching the lights on at the start and switching them off at the end. Um, occupancy control is not an ideal um, solution for HID, both for the pure switching capacity, but HID needs time to run up to its output, but it also needs time to cool down before it restrikes. So in an occupancy control situation, once a space is vacant and somebody enters very quickly, the lights won't come on immediately. They will struggle and, and attempt to strike until it gets down to you know, eight or ten minutes later, and then the lights will strike and then come up again. Task tuning, so we can't dim HID traditionally. We can't take you know, 15 or 20 percent off the top end. They are all on or they are all off. Um, time scheduling, we could, we could engage time scheduling, so uh, turn the lights on at a certain time and off at a certain time, but time scheduling is becoming a little bit more uh, difficult as we're working longer hours, um, uh, so nothing worse than having the lights turn off automatically on you halfway through a job. Um, daylight harvesting and load shedding, uh, the, these are two, again, uh, dimming type um, uh, behaviours. You know, we can't traditionally dim a HID light source generally. There are some drivers and ceramic lamps that can do some level of dimming, but it's uh, a very much uh, specialised area. Um, and they can really only do like one step. So we got 100% on and possibly dim to, to about 60%. Okay, but in general terms, um, you know, you're very, very limited in, in terms of the, the amount of lighting control that you can apply to a HID light source. 
Um, moving on to fluorescent. Um, this is a, a great light source. Um, you know, high levels of uh, illumination, uh, great efficacy, um, and we've got some you know really good um, control options where we can. Uh, yeah, we've got a, an energy efficient light source um, where we can uh, dim the lights so we can do some personal control in the space so not just on and off but we could uh, you know dim them up or down depending on the, the application um, occupancy control so we can have a vacancy sensor that will turn the lights off when the place is vacated and turn them on when, it, when there's uh, occupants uh, another question just come in. So, can you quickly explain load shedding? Load shedding is, uh, you know, peak demand. So, if they're in a particular time of day, um, if uh, a particular area of a building is, uh, you know, chewing a lot of energy, and another area, uh, you know, is not doing a hell of a lot, and we can top end trim and share the load around the space, so the, the energy footprint. Uh, of the building doesn't change, but we can uh, dim the lights in one area that doesn't affect the occupants. We can dim, you know, five or ten percent without picking up uh, the, the human eye won't pick that that variance up. But we can share that energy into the rest of the building uh, to to whatever the, the peak demand location is. Um, moving on with the the presentation, task tuning. Um, uh, load shedding and daylight harvesting. So if I can bundle all those three together into the, the dimming um, type of uh, scenario. So we can apply you know, 1 to 10 or DALI or DSI dimming. Um, you know, we can top end trim, we can do step or corridor control. Um, so it's, it's, there's a lot of flexibility um, and obviously time scheduling as well. Again, a great light source for, for high bay uh, applications. Um, uh, there are some minor limitations with it, okay, some drawbacks. So there is the service side of things. So you need to swap out lamps, you know, every 20 to 24,000 hours. Um, there may be, in the application, you may need to put a uh, lens in front of it um, to protect, um, you know, potential breakages from glass from entering the space so that that lens uh, will need to be removed and cleaned um, in extreme temperatures, really, really hot or really, really cold. Um, T5 um, can reduce its output, um, so the lighting levels will diminish. Um, so uh, these are some drawbacks, uh, but uh, you know, again, this is still a very, very good light source to use in, in high bay applications. Now onto LED. Um, LED, uh, as Yasik uh, mentioned before, is, is an extremely flexible and dynamic uh, lighting solution that uh, really lends itself to all levels of uh, lighting control. Um, all of the dimming, um, uh, all of the instant on and instant off characteristics that, that we would like to see in these spaces. We want the lights to come on as soon as we enter and we would like them to turn off um, without uh, you know, having a run-up time or, or anything like that. Uh, a great application, especially in a high base situation. If you're, you're running around a warehouse on a forklift, um, maybe we can put a corridor function into an aisle. So when there's no action in the aisle, we can dim the lights to, to maybe 30%. And then when somebody enters that aisle, the, the lights can then dim up to their 80 or 90% that we need. Um, without giving that pop-on glare startle uh, to the guy in the forklift that you might lose uh, a vision for, for a split second. Um, we can also uh, apply uh, a thing called constant lumen output. So we can underrun the LED at the very beginning of its lifetime, still delivering us the, the, the light output we need and stagger over particular uh, time frames, ramping up to give us the consistent life, uh, sorry, consi consistent light output over, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80, 100,000 hours. Um, uh, you know, th when we're talking lifetime with fluorescent, that's generally lifetime to fail, so no light. When we're talking lifetime with LED, that's, that's uh, lifetime to uh, lumen depreciation. So we've still got light and, uh, coming from the device. So these are, uh, you know, some some real strengths with uh, with uh, solid state lighting. 
if I can use some of Steve's um, examples, and, and by the way, if you've got any questions, um, just type them in the, the question box at the bottom of your screen, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. Um, so looking at Steve's uh, examples that he was referring to earlier on, so High Bay Application 1, okay, so an automatic, you know, or a food processing plant. So what could we use? Could we use you know, HID? Uh, could we use fluorescent or could we use uh, LED? Um, uh, in this sort of space, we could use any of them, but the drawbacks with using uh, especially uh, fluorescent and HID, we're going to need, we're going to have to put a cover, uh, an IP lens um, on the fixture. You know, especially with HID, you know, it needs to be an enclosed fixture um, uh, to stop uh, any potential glass contamination into the food. Same with uh, T5 or fluorescent, any breakages uh, could potentially mean um, some foreign objects uh, entering um, the, the food uh, manufacturing. Um, temperature may be a little bit of a concern in this sort of application. It's going to be a little bit on the cooler side, so T5 may take time to run up to its full output. LED will give us the instant on. Um, running it at a cooler uh, ambient temperature means we can uh, get a longer life out of the product. Um, we can look at all manner of uh, lighting control in there. We can do some daylight harvesting, utilize whatever uh, daylight is present, um, as well as uh, dim up and dim down. Um, another question come up. Induction. I knew this was going to come up. Induction lighting. Um, we haven't covered induction lighting. It is Yes, it is an option for um, high bay or, uh, you know, open area lighting. Um, but it's a perfectly viable uh, light source, you know, high output, long life uh, light source. There are some uh, drawbacks, you know, it's a quite a bulky fixture for one, uh, for, you know, the bang for your buck, it's a very, very big uh, fixture. And you potentially run into some issues with uh, EMI. Um, Sometimes also the gear tends to be a lot lossier. So um, we've sort of picked on the, the three common um, ones, but yeah, induction uh, high bays are still readily used, uh, but not, uh, my personal opinion, not, um, not as common uh, as the, the three that we're discussing today. Okay, uh, focus on Steve's second um, application. Um, so this, we're talking uh, higher light levels, um, same space, a higher ambient temperature. Um, in this sort of space, we could, um, it, we, again, we'd probably look at more LED uh, and fluorescent um, because we, we, we need to be dynamic, okay? If we've got dynamic lighting control, it essentially rules out HID straight off the bat. Uh, we need to save energy, save us money. Um, uh, in this sort of application, we could potentially underrun our LEDs, so the uh, operational temperature, uh, in combination with the ambient temperature, uh, we still maximise the performance and the lifetime of the fitting. Um, <coughs> uh, the, like I mentioned before, in in, uh, in an example, um, using a, a corridor function or a step dim function in aisleways is a great, very very simple way to uh, get some. Uh, aggressive savings uh, you know, in these sorts of applications with uh, this uh, solid state lighting. Um, I'm nearing the end, or in fact I'm at the end of my presentation. Um, I can see somebody's got their hand up in the, in the presentation. Uh, I won't be able to hear you. Um, if you can just post your question in, uh, just write your question in the bottom, in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, that'd be great. If you've got any questions whatsoever, um, please uh, fire them through. I'll do my very best to, to answer them. Um, uh, if you've got any further questions on this, I'll, uh, I'd strongly recommend you that uh, you go to the Voltman website and, and post them on the uh, Ask the Experts section. There's a number of uh, colleagues uh, there ready to, to answer the questions with all, all manner of uh, experience and skill. Um, so I'll, I'll take this opportunity to thank uh, everybody to take their time out uh, in their busy schedules 
uh, to, to listen to us, the three of us. I'll thank my two colleagues, Jacek and Steve, uh, for their participation. Um, we've got um, a very, very short uh, survey. Um, it takes about 30 seconds to fill out at the end. Um, again, thank you. Any questions, post them uh, on the website. Um, but until next time, talk to you soon.